we were in chapter 3 um, on, on uh, Wednesday night in our study in Philippians, and it seemed appropriate to take a piece of this and use it in in our communion time this morning. We have a tendency very often um, as believers to lose our way. We have a tendency very often for our lives, though we know Jesus Christ is our savior, we have a tendency, we know we're going to heaven, but we become confused. We become, we find that life sometimes can um, just become chaotic and, and we lose our path in many ways. We, we lose scope and we wonder why things are happening to us. And so much of what Paul says in these verses that we're going to look at this morning really address the issue. And, and his point is to continue on, to press on. The idea is like to agonize on, uh, for to reach upward to the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. This idea of pressing on, it's so important and it's not, it's not something that typically we want to do. But it's exactly what God has called us to do. And Paul is saying we need to keep perspective on the things that matter. We need to seek, as he does, to seek to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and to press on toward the prize. And so in these first um, six or so verses, he, he talks, he warns the Philippians about the Judaizers and what they were coming to do, and he, he actually gives his own pedigree and his accomplishments. And he says, you know, though I have all of that, though I've got all of the trophies and I've got all of the accolades and I've got all the diplomas and I've got all that stuff on my, on my mantle, it's nothing. It's worthless. Forget about it. He says, there's something far more important here. We'll pick up in verse 7, and he says this, he says, but those things that were gained to me, those things in the past, my background, my pedigree, you know, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, Hebrew of the Hebrew, tribe of Benjamin, part of the covenant, all those things. What things were gained to me? He says, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, yes indeed, I have also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish. Your Bible may say dung. The newer translations say rubbish, dung. And you know what that means. And I can say that in church because it's in the Bible. So <laughs> dung. Waste. If you want to think of it as waste, okay, I think of it as dung. He says, um, compared, or is the idea, I consider them as dung, that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but a righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already attained or that I'm already perfected or made mature is the idea. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. He says, there is a purpose for my life. There is a purpose for our lives. And that's, he said, I don't even understand why I have been apprehended, but I continue to press on that I may apprehend that for which I've been apprehended. Brothers, I don't count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He's saying, I've got it all. I had it all. I did all these things. And they are nothing. They are loss to me. They don't count in terms of my relationship with Jesus Christ. He made he made, a, he made a choice to not value those things as he understands the value of his relationship in Jesus Christ. He looks at his background, how often we look at our backgrounds. And he says, I look at my background, I look at this pedigree, I look at the purity of my bloodline, I look at all of these things. He says, it's nothing, it's a loss. He looks at his knowledge of the law, how often we, we um, emphasize our education now, whether we went through 6th or 8th grade or 12th grade or, or we, we got a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or we, something greater than that. 
And he says, it's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. He says, zeal for God. He says, it's, it's absolutely nothing at all. There's no comparison. He says, he says his, his, what he does, and we can think of it ourselves, my profession, my possessions, my, my house, my cars, my, you know, those kinds of things. Dung, he says. It stinks. It's dung. In other, it's a comparative statement. It's waste compared to knowing Jesus Christ. This is a Bucks County message if you ever heard one, right? He says, it's waste. It's dung. His righteousness, legalistic righteousness, in, in terms of you know, following the law. It's just a whole lot of dung. He says, it's waste because it's nothing compared to to knowing Jesus Christ. And this is not the only time we find this in Scripture. We certainly find it in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 64. He says there, God says through Isaiah, that all of our righteous acts, not our, not our sins, our righteous acts, those things we do to, to make God think we're okay and we're going to please him, he says, I consider them as filthy rags, the rags you would use to, to wipe up waste, dung even. It's important for us to remember how God sees us. We look at ourselves through our own eyes sometimes. We compare ourselves to one another and, and we think, oh, I'm just not measuring up. If we are in Jesus Christ, he looks at us through the blood of Christ. It's such an important, it's a simple principle, but it's hard for us to, to hold on to and to remember this very important, powerful, life-transforming truth. He looks at us through the sacrifice of his son for us if you are in Jesus Christ. And you're in Jesus Christ when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, when you believe that Jesus Christ paid the price for your sins. You're not just here, but you're following him. You're, you're following him, you trust him, you're in Christ. You've placed your faith. You know that when you die, you will be with him, not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done for us. That's the simplicity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you're in Christ, then you can know that. And, and he says it's important that we, that we stay on course. He says that I may know him. I want to have this experience of knowing him. Now, I want you to think about this, but Paul is in a prison cell, all right? And he's 30 years in the Lord at this point. You know, we have this tendency to, I don't know what we think, we just, you know, we go chapter by chapter so we don't think of how long years go. Uh, how long has he been an apostle? 25 years, you know, roughly. So 30 years, and here he is saying that I may know Christ. <laughs> yeah, well, he already knows him. You say, Paul, what, what, what are you after here? That I may know him. I want the experience of knowing him more. You know, Jesus Christ is, is eternal. He's infinite. And so the more we come to know him, the more we realize how much more of him there is to know, and that we not be satisfied with where we are, but we continue to move. And he, that's his desire. He said that I may know him, and that I may know the power of his resurrection. The power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You'll say in Romans that, um, that if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead is also present in you, then that same power will transform our lowly bodies to be like his bodies. That's important that we, that we understand that. He's saying, I want to know him. I want to know the power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. No, we don't say that we want to do that, do we? You know, we, we, we want to be comfortable. We want things easy. We want things light. We don't want things heavy. The fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. None of us want that. None of us invite pain. None of us invite disease. None of us invite business failure. None of us invite these great difficulties, relationship problems, divorce issues. None of us invite those things. But the issue is that in the fellowship of his suffering, we understand the power of his resurrection. Think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That Daniel chapter 3, where they chose to stand. When everybody else was bowing down to the idol, they chose to stand. When everybody was bowing down, and we do it in our society, we see it all around us, people are bowing down to the idol of our culture, bowing down to the culture, bowing down to what everybody else says, bowing down to political correctness, bowing down to what everybody else says. But those who stand are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, those who will take a stand for what is right. And they took a stand, they say, we will not bow down to the idol. 
And Neb said, you don't understand, it's gonna get hot. And they said, you, you can throw us in the oven and we may die, but we will not bow down. So he heated it up seven times hotter than it ought to be. And, and he, so the Bible says that it even burned up the, the guards, the soldiers that were there, and they threw them in. And then later on, Neb looks in and he says, wait a minute, didn't we throw three guys in here? How come there's four here and one of them looks like the son of God? That's the idea. That's the idea. It's in the midst of the fire that they experience the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ as they had fellowship in his sufferings. It's in the midst of difficulty that we experience the power of Jesus Christ. None of us invites difficulty, but if we want to experience the power of his resurrection in reality, if we want to experience the power of his resurrection in our lives, it will happen through the school of suffering. It's the way it works. And, you know, I know that we don't want to sing happy, clappy songs after hearing that. But the reality is, that's what the Bible says. The reality is, that's how God works. The reality is, and, 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 and this is not masochism or sadism, but the reality is that God uses suffering in our lives of all sorts. Like, like an, artist, an artist would use a palette of color and a brush, and he would paint on a, on a palette, on, on a canvas. God does that with our lives. He uses these things. He's not a sadist, but he uses these things that we would know Jesus Christ better because he loves us. He uses these things for us. And we need to choose when we go through these difficult times. We need to choose to allow him to be present in our sufferings. He says, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, by any means that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained. He says, I'm not there yet. I haven't, you know, I have not arrived. None of us have arrived. None of us has arrived. Here, here's the Apostle Paul. If anybody has arrived in a human sense, it would be the Apostle Paul. He says, not that I've arrived or attained. He says, or that I've been made perfect or, or mature, but I press on. That's the idea, this idea of pressing on. We don't want to do it. There's resistance in our lives to pressing through the difficulty to know Christ, pressing through. It's difficult. You ever find yourself where, where you're sick and you're just lying in bed and you know, you know, the best thing would be just to spend some time with the Lord right now. It's like, I don't want to, you know, and, and, and we, but to press through, to press through in the difficulty to know Christ in the midst of it. You know, and, and it's amazing to me, you, know, you think about the, what we even tell our kids, you know, to, to, to work hard, study hard, get through high school so that you're prepared for college and, and work hard through college, you're prepared for a career. I mean, think about how we prepare for a job interview. Think about how people prepare for, you know, for whatever sport that they're in, the, the difficulty we endure in order to do that kind of a thing. Think of how, you know, those of you who are in sales, I understand, you know, what, what, how, how much effort we put into preparing for the sales presentation. And here we are talking about, but, you know, by, there's no comparison with how important this is. To prepare for what? Eternity. We're in Christ. Now he says, now press on press on. He says, that's what I do. He says, I press hold for a purpose that I may lay hold, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. He doesn't understand why Christ has laid hold of him. I don't understand. How, does, how can any of us in this room say, I understand why I'm saved. I understand what he saw in me. There's nothing in me to merit salvation. There's nothing at all. There's certainly nothing in me to merit being a pastor. You know, it's, but I don't understand that. Maybe it's divine humor. I don't understand what it is. But, but he has chosen to do these things in our lives. He says, so I press on that I may lay hold or apprehend that for which Christ has apprehended me, that he's laid hold of me. This one thing I do, he says. I don't count myself, verse 13, to have apprehended, but one thing I do. One thing I do. There's one thing that he does. And it's so important for every Christian that we understand the one thing. Because there are a lot of in very interesting, actually, one thing statements that you'll find in the scripture. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus. 
You know, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, well, you know the law, and he goes down the list of the commandments. All of these I have kept since my youth. And you can think what you want about that. You can think, wow, that guy really stacks up. Or you can think, you got to be kidding me. Either way, all these I've kept since my youth. And I think it's the first, not the second. What yet do I lack? Jesus says, one thing you lack. Sell everything you have, give it to the poor, you'll have treasure in heaven, then follow me. He's not saying you lack poverty, and that's what you need to, you have to take a vow of poverty to be saved. He's saying these things in your life, this treasure in your life controls your life. Get it out of the way, place your focus on me, that's the one thing, and follow me. Martha and Mary. You know, Jesus is there in the house with, you know, the guys, and, and um, they're both preparing the meal, and Mary leaves Martha to go sit at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's ticked. I mean, you know, come on. You've got the Savior of mankind sitting in your living room. It's enough to think of what am I going to serve him, let alone, you know, we need some help here. And, and half of the labor force is gone, you know, sitting in the living room with him and not working in the kitchen. So she comes to Jesus and says, yeah, master, rebuke him. Rebuke her, you know. Martha, Martha, you're, you're worried. You're, 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 you're all strung out. You're, you're strangled by so many things. You're fretting. It's killing you. Mary has chosen that one thing. Only one thing matters, and Mary has chosen it, and it will not be denied her. One thing. You know, John chapter 9, think of it, you know, where the, um, the blind man, the, the man born blind, and, and Jesus, you know, puts mud in his eye and then um, sends him down to the pool of Siloam to wash. And, and he comes back, and, and everybody's blown away. This man can see now. And, and the Pharisees want to know, whoa, 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 what's going on? Because this was a Sabbath when this happened. So how did this happen now? Well, you know, this guy came, and he put mud in my eye, made mud, put it in my eye, and sent me down to the pool to wash. Whoa. And they're upset because there's work involved. There was the making of mud, putting it in his eye. They're not seeing. The guy can see. They're not seeing that the guy can see. And now, who was it? I don't know. I mean, he came along and he did this. So they ask him a second time. Tell us again. How did it go? And he gives them more detail. And the third time they ask him. Now, again, how did it work? And who was this? He said, look, look they. He said, Three times you're asking me this question. I told you already. You know, he, he gave me sight. Talk to him. Maybe he'll give you hearing. Aren't you listening to what I'm saying? And, and, and he says, this one thing I know. I don't know about that. I don't know the guy's name. I don't know any of that. One thing I know. I was blind. Now I see. One thing I know. I was lost. Now I'm found. One thing I know. I was in the dark. Now I'm in the light. One thing I know. I was outside of Christ. Now I'm in Christ. One thing. David, fleeing from Saul at the cave of Adullam. And and, and those who were distressed and in debt and discontent, the offscouring of, of, of Israel, in a sense, come to him, and they band with him. And what do they call that? Broke, busted, and disgusted. And, and, and they, they come to his side. And he writes there in that cave, Psalm 27, one thing I've desired of the Lord, this thing I ask, that I may behold the beauty of the Lord, that I may dwell in his temple and inquire of him there. One thing, one thing. Jesus, I mean, in, in um, Isaiah chapter 50, it's a very interesting passage, says this. He said, I gave my back to the strikers, my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I, I hid not my face from the shame and the spitting. Therefore, get this, I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He set his face like a flint. We see that in midway through Luke, where Jesus turns from Galilee, he sets his face toward Jerusalem. And from that point forward, it's all about going to the cross. And, and you know, we, we look at the life of Christ, and, and by no means do I mean to diminish it, but we look at the life of Christ and what is happening there. The, the miracles are, are so powerful, and the teaching is, is amazing. And you look at everything he's doing, but the purpose for which he came was to go to the cross to pay the price for our sins. One thing. He said, I have set my face like a flint. One thing. One thing. 
And Paul says, so I press on. I press on. I forget those things which are behind. And I reach forward to those things which are ahead. The, the glory of being with Jesus Christ. The, the, to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. To re receive reward one day. He says, this is a race. You know, we, we see Paul use this imagery a number of times when he, when, when he writes. This idea of the race. I press on. It's difficult, is the idea. To press on, to reach forward, to, say this, to, stress, to stretch, to agonize, in, in other words. You know, and, 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 and it's work. We don't like that. He says, but I do it for a purpose. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's the reason that I do it. He says earlier, he said, look at, look at all my religious achievement. He said, forget about it. All those things, forget about it. It makes no sense. It makes no, no reason to, 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 to even think about those things. All the accomplishments in his life, forget about those accomplishments. I mean, think about sins. I mean, here's the Apostle Paul. He has the blood of the martyrs on his hand. He, 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 he committed people to death. How many, how many faces of little children who watch their parents be arrested and then go to death still haunt him in his mind? And he says, I forget those things and I press on. I reach forward that I may lay hold of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Bitterness. Think of the things in our own lives. Think of accomplishments or, or loss. Think of sin that we can't get out of our head. Think of bitterness, the Apostle Paul, bitterness from, from or, or, or in risk of bitterness from being hurt by Christians. It's bad enough to be hurt by, by the world, but when it's your own family, when it's, uh, when it's the, the blood-bought bride of Christ that turns on you and says things, and they said it about Paul, they made, all, they made jokes about him. They said, he's not an apostle. They, they'll listen to him speak. I mean, all kinds of things. Wouldn't that create bitterness in you? I mean, and, and you start to realize, that even as this is a great way to get people into ministry, as you get into ministry, how much more than these things happen and, and, and sometimes how easy it is to start to, to go into bitterness. He says, forgetting those things which are behind. Well, how do you forget? I mean, because the Lord doesn't remember our sins. When we come to Christ, he doesn't remember our sins anymore. That's what he says. David says in, in Psalm 25, remember not the sins of my youth. It says in Psalm 103, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's put our sins from himself. Jeremiah, of course, says he remembers our sins no more. You say, well, okay, I get it. You know, you've told me often enough that, that God can choose not to remember, but I can't forget. You know, I understand that, but the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. So if we're in Christ, we have the mind of Christ. And if we have the mind of Christ, we can still make that choice. You got to be kidding me. No, I'm not kidding. And I'm not, I haven't attained. Don't misunderstand. But we will be controlled by what we behold. The more we look at something, we will be controlled by that thing. The more we look back, and look, there are no pat problems and there are no pat answers to those problems. I wish there were, there aren't. Some of us come from terrible backgrounds, just really rough backgrounds. Some of us are, are dealing with disease. Some of us are dealing with great you know, financial problems. There's all sorts of things that go through our lives or happen to our lives. But the more we look at those things and not Jesus Christ, we will be controlled by what we behold. So the more we look to him, the more we will become like him. And the more we will know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing and the sufferings in the midst of those difficulties. I didn't say it was easy. I said it's what the Bible says. And I said it's what the Apostle Paul is saying that he does. And so it's important as we come to communion, to understand that what he's done for us is everything. What we have in Christ already is everything. All the riches are ours in Christ Jesus. 
the power of his resurrection available to us in Christ Jesus, the fellowship of, of, of being with him as we're in Christ Jesus. And so we come to this point today where we, we're going to spend some time as we worship in remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and understanding what we have in him. I'd ask you to pray with me. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for um, the power of the promise that we have in the, in the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for new lives. We thank you for um, all that you've given us in Christ. And may, may no person in here think that this is considered easy or cheap. Because what we have and the strength to take the next step and the strength to say the next word and the strength to face tomorrow is only found in Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, as we spend this time and we remember your broken body, Lord, as we remember your shed blood, may you be glorified, Lord as we worship. In Jesus' name, amen.